Welcome back. Good to see all of you. I hope you are healthy and well. And uh, y'all pray for me because I'm slightly, like, slightly nervous here. I'm afraid of heights. And uh, this thing is pretty narrow here, you know, so y'all pray for me. Uh, all right, but welcome. Uh, today is a, a unique chapel in the sense that today is the actual birthday of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. And today we'll, we will be honoring him and the principles he stood for uh, during this chapel. We'll have a panel discussion uh, that I would like you to be a part of. But as we prepare our minds and hearts today uh, to worship, uh, I'd like you to listen to the words of Scripture uh, in Luke chapter 10, beginning at verse 29. This man wanted to justify his actions, so he asked Jesus, and who is my neighbor? Jesus replied with a story. A Jewish man was traveling from Jerusalem down to Jericho, and he was attacked by bandits. They stripped him of his clothes, beat him up, and left him half dead beside the road. By chance, a priest came along. But when he saw the man lying there, he crossed to the other side of the road and passed him by. A temple assistant walked over there and looked at him lying on the ground, but he also passed by on the other side. Then a despised Samaritan came along. And when he saw the man, he felt compassion for him. Going over to him, the Samaritan soothed his wounds with olive oil and wine bandage and, and bandaged them. Then he put the man on his own donkey and took him to an inn where he took care of him. The next day he handed the innkeeper two silver coins telling him, take care of this man. If his bill runs higher than this, I'll pay you the next time I'm here. Now, which of these three would you say was a neighbor to the man who was attacked by bandits? Jesus asked. The man replied, the one who showed him mercy. Then Jesus said, yes, now go and do likewise. Let's pray. Uh, Father, we thank you for our time together that we get to pause in our day and to sit in your presence. Uh, so much going on. Um, seems like a lot of people are battling different viruses and bugs like that. And uh, we just want to pause in your presence and be, uh, just to be. Thank you for uh, the life of Dr. Martin Luther King. Um, he wasn't a perfect man, but he gave his life in terms of a, a, for a good cause. And uh, as we remember him and honor his legacy, I pray that you would speak to our hearts so that we would give our lives for your purposes and for your glory. We ask that your presence would be felt here and known and that you just bring peace and clarity to our minds and hearts. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This morning we're going to be led in singing by uh, Mr. Julius Dix, would you please give him a hand as he comes? In such 
That's not going to work. Good morning. That's not going to work. Good morning. That still ain't going to work. Good morning. Now nah, that's better. That's better. I know that um, most of you probably when you go to church, you probably just sit and just listen, correct? But where I come from, you participate. Y'all catch my drift? All right. Well, someone shook their head. Wonderful, wonderful. Wrong key. I'm going to get to a line, and I want you to repeat after me. Is that all right? Okay. Let me, let, let's rehearse. We lift your name on high. Oh, y'all slow. We lift your name on high. Do it one more time. Let's try it again. We lift your name on high. It's getting there. All right. The splendor of a king. Clothed in man. Let all the earth rejoice. Let all the earth rejoice. Yeah, clap your hands. He wrapped himself in light, and darkness tried to hide. It trembles at his voice. It trembles at his voice. If you know it, sing with me. Come on. How great is our God? Come on, sing me out, great is our God, and all see out, great, how great is our God. Second verse, good. clap your hands, come on. Age to age we stand, time is in his hand, beginning and
shake it up a little bit. Come on, everybody, how great. Come on, how great. Sing me how great is that. And all see how great, how great is our God. Clap your hands. Keep clapping your hands. Keep clapping your hands. Listen. We lift your name on high. We lift your name on high. Come on. We lift your name on high. Everybody say higher. 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 Say yeah. You're a great God. Say yeah. You're a great God. Come on. Say, yeah. 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 We lift your name on high. Say it. That's it. We lift your name on high. Say, higher. 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 How great is our God. Come on, say it. Sing. That's the idea. And all see how great, how great is our God. Come on, clap your hands, everybody. Now remain right where you are. Don't, don't move. Don't move. Don't move. Now, this next song we're going to do is complete. They switch my, oh, okay. There's that better. Okay, can you give me a little bit more in the monitor here? Wonderful. It was probably me, yeah. Uh, okay. Again, you have to repeat after me, okay? All you have to do is say everything that I say. If I say, go jump out the window. <laughs> so whatever I say, all right? <laughs> I'm not going to say that, I promise you. Okay. Okay. Y'all ready to go? Give your hands, give yourself a hand for the Roberts Wesleyan Choir. All right. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Your life frees me to sing. Everybody, I will praise you all my day. Perfect in all your ways. Hail Jesus, you're my Lord. Clap your hand, come on. I will obey your word. I won't see your kingdom come. Not my will, but yours be done. Glory, glory to the Lamb. You will take us into the land. You got it. Come on. We will conquer in your name and proclaim that Jesus reign. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. How wonderful you are. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. How powerful you are. Hail Jesus, you're my king. Come on, everybody. Your life frees me to sing. I will praise you all my days. Perfect in all your way. That's it. Glory, glory to the Lamb. 
you will take us into the land. We will conquer in your name and proclaim that Jesus reigns. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. How wonderful you are. Hail, hail, Lion of Judah. How powerful you are. Come on. How powerful you are. Say, how wonderful you are. Can't hear you. How wonderful you are. Listen, give him the praise. You got to give it up. Come on. Give him the praise. You got to give it up. Come on. Give him the praise because he's been so good. Give him the praise because he's been so kind. Give him the praise because he brought me through. Give him the praise because he's a friend of mine. Give it up. You got to give it up. Come on. Give it up. You got to give it up. Listen. I get, 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 give it up. Come on. I get, 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 give it up. Give him the praise. You got to give him the praise. Come on, say how wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. How powerful you are. How powerful you got it. How wonderful you are. How wonderful you are. How powerful you are. How powerful you are. Clap your hands, everybody. There you go. Oh. Thank you. Give him another round of applause, please. Thank you. Man, I heard y'all. You got to get, get, give it up. <laughs> I heard y'all. Good stuff. Good stuff. Well, uh, this morning I have some guest panelists with me. And uh, I'm going to ask them to start to come on up here, which is a little tricky here. Let me get out the way and let y'all come on up. And I will uh, introduce them. I have... We have with us this morning, Kristen Brown. She's the Associate Dean and Assistant Professor of Church and Mission at Northeastern Seminary. Next up, Herb Alexander. Yeah. He's the Director of Diversity and Equity here at Roberts. And last but not least, is David Carr. He is the assistant professor of biblical studies here at Roberts Wesleyan College. And so thank you all for joining us this morning. Now, I wanna set this discussion up. We're gonna talk about beloved community. Beloved community. Uh, this was a philosophy of Dr. Martin Luther King's, which I believe comes from scripture. Uh, the passage I read earlier was about uh, loving, we're called to love our neighbors. And who is our neighbor? Whoever <laughs> is, everyone is our neighbor, really. Um, and I want to begin by talking about um, what I call a tale of two kings. A tale of two kings. This first king I want to tell you about is Rodney King. How many of you have ever heard that name before, Rodney King? Okay, all right. We'll see if we're talking about the same Rodney King. Uh, in my second year of high school, there was something that happened in California that shook our nation. There was a gentleman named Rodney King who was driving while intoxicated. And he led the police on, they, on a high-speed chase. They were trying to catch him. And when they finally caught him, they got him. And, you know, he resisted arrest a little bit. And then they begin to use force. But then they begin to just take it to an extreme and they begin to use excessive force. And they really begin to pound him. And he took a beating. And someone captured this 
on their uh, camcorder, sent it into the news. This picture was being blasted all over uh, the states. And when these police officers, in the, in the video you could see a couple of police officers grabbing two of them saying, look, that's enough, you know, the guy's not getting up, that's enough. Uh, but when the time came, these officers were acquitted. And when they were acquitted, violence just erupted in L.A. And we had what was known, these L.A. riots that were just violent, terrible, I mean, havoc, such anger. And, you know, this really sounds like this incident could be told today. Like this happened yesterday. Um, but when all of this was happening, all of these riots, they brought Rodney King on the news to try to get people to stop. And when they brought him on, he had this famous phrase, I don't know if you know it, but he just got on the news and he said, look, you know, stop. Can't we all just get along? Can't we all just get along? And that was a phrase, and it became repeated on Saturday Night Live, different comedy shows. You know, they would make it a joke. You know, can't we all just get it along? Can't we all just get along? But that's one type of philosophy. You know, in order to stop from just fighting or stop the conflict, we just agree to get along. Meaning that we really don't resolve our differences. We just go along to get along. But then there's the, this other king, Dr. Martin Luther King, who had this philosophy of beloved community. And in, with this philosophy of beloved community, people will ask him, you know, during his protests, uh, during the civil rights movement, they would say, you know, what's the goal of this? And his response would be, look, the goal of a civil rights movement is not nonviolence. Nonviolence is not the goal. But the goal is beloved community. Beloved community is when enemies become friends. It's when the oppressed and the oppressor become brothers, sisters, brothers and sisters. And so he had this philosophy that says, look, we're not just doing this just to get along, but we're doing this because we truly believe that change is possible and that Christ calls us to love one another. It's not enough just to get along. Now, when you think about this in our time, where we are today, I mean, our nation is kind of just divided, or at least that's the picture we see in media. But many of you feel this tension, like maybe like because you know what we're getting ready to talk about. Maybe you're even clamming up a little bit like, oh, here we go again, you know, because this is a tough thing to talk about. And when you talk about it, you want to you want to take the topic serious. And you don't want, you know, any trite answers, but when talking about anything, there, there's a lot of emotion. There's a lot of feeling that go into it. And so this morning, we're going to have this discussion on beloved community with these wonderful people. And uh, I've got some questions. We also, we're missing a panel member. Uh, she's out sick today. Um, it was our Hispanic sister, uh, Lisa DeVinney. Um, she was going to be a part. She's sorry that she can't be a part. And so I am going to host the conversation, and participate in the conversation as well. And so, while I open my notes here, why don't you give these folks another hand for being with us. All right, here we go. Also, uh, if time goes well, uh, I'll open it up to you all in the audience for questions as well, so, all right. All right, so our first question, you know, um, our discussion this morning is about community. How would each of you define community? I got. Where are you going, man? I gotta go first. I was gonna take their answers. <laughs> um, so the question is, what is community? How do I understand community? And um, there are all different kinds of ways of defining community in different contexts. So I. I'm going to reframe the question, take a little bit of liberty with it. What's a Christian vision for community? Or what characterizes a Christian vision for community? And every time um, I think about Christian community, my mind goes to two passages in Acts. Acts 2, 41 to 47, and Acts 4, 32 to 35. Um, write that down. Uh, <laughs> now, they're, they're the, yeah, you'll be tested on this later. But there, there are these summary statements in Acts. Describe the earliest believers 
in an ideal life, community life together. They're breaking bread, they're sharing meals, they're praying, they're following the disciples or the apostles' teachings. But what's eye-opening is that in both of these descriptions, they were sharing possessions. And when someone was in need in the community, people were selling their possessions to make sure that those who did not have what they needed had what they needed. And to get an idea of what a radical vision this was, imagine if, it, if, if you're a church member, if you go to a church, and it was really common for you to walk into church and your pastor to step up on a Sunday morning and to say, it's just come to my attention that one of our members has a new job but no transportation. I know that a number of you have two cars. Which one of you is going to step up and sell your other car to this member or give it to them or sell them and give them money? And for that to be completely normal. It's a, it's a radical vision for radical sharing to make sure that those who are without power find empowerment and a place in the community and that those without resources find resources. Uh, it's a community striving towards equity uh, for the people who are in Christ. So that's some of what characterizes the, division, the, the vision for community in my eyes. Yeah, that was a good answer. Um, I'm gonna try to follow up. So uh, I would say for me, when you think of the idea of community, just on a surface level, um, it's just a group of people who are together and they have a shared idea or shared belief or um, just a shared way of life or custom. So when you think of the Roberts community here, right, we share that we are a part of the Roberts community, right? We go here, you're all students, I work here. So on some level, way, shape, or form, we share an idea, right, or a belief. But I think adding a word to that, I would say a thriving or flourishing community is when people uh, can be a part of a community where they are celebrated, not tolerated for being in it, right? So you're celebrated um, not because you are similar to everyone else, but because of your differences, right? You're celebrated for your uh, ability to be unique, right? So you bring in what you have, and then we all take all those different perspectives, and it creates one thing that's flourishing. And that's a flourishing community to me, right? When people can be celebrated uh, just for who they are. And so I, I think right now you spoke to the, the idea of division. I think is people aren't celebrating somebody else's differences. And I think that's, that's a lot of the challenge. And so as we go through our community here, uh, I would say it's very important for us to make sure that we are not just tolerating people being here, right? You're just not all getting along in a sense. You are celebrating people who are a part of your community uh, in different ways, you know? Yeah, similar. Um, I think when I think of community, um, I think of uh, the space in which we are able to be most fully and freely ourselves, where we have all that we need to make our unique contributions in the world. And I think one of the, um, to your point on sort of um, the, the idea of, you know, we all share something together, but sometimes we hold that too narrowly. Like we expect everyone, we need to expand our understanding of what we should hold in common, right? Our definition of who gets to come to mind when we say this is common? This is, this is what it means to be an American, right? This is what it looks like to be an American. That's one of the conversations that's going on in the broader community. Who gets to count among us? And I think our growing understanding and definition of who gets to count among us, who belongs here, I think um, as I think of scripture, I see this continual expanding of God's mission. God is continually moving outward and expanding who gets to count and be part of us and be among us. All great responses. So as you look at what's happening in our nation today, um, what would you say is popping up on the radar that are some barriers to achieving community? Yeah, uh, so I'll start that off. I think, to be honest, something I see is as a, as a nation in the U.S., we don't do an amazing job of when there's a problem or a conflict within our community, we don't do a, a great job of restoration or recognizing that there was a problem and then reconciling that. So if you think of any relationship or any great family household, you have incidents, conflicts, because those are bound to happen, right? And then you resolve those. It's a communication. I did this wrong. You may have done this wrong. How do we go forward? But as a nation, we don't do that amazingly well. And so what happens is we have a conflict, and it may lead to a law being passed to change it. Right, and then people just bunker down on their perspectives on the conflict, who was wrong, who was right, but there's not really compromise in the middle. And so I'm reminded of 
um, apartheid in the 19, like 80s, 90s, right? Apartheid happened in South Africa, and there's similar things that happen here in America as far as race and division and Jim Crow and all that, right? And so what they did, though, when they um, kind of revolted against that and that was overthrown, instead of throwing the people who were the oppressors and just throwing them in jail or whatever have you, they did something called truth trials. And so the people who were the victims and the people who were the oppressors came together and they talked about it in these trials. And so people were able to express their hurt and then the people who hurt were able to hear that and either express they were sorry or what they thought at the time. And so that led to reconciliation and they have advanced in a way that we haven't been able to do that here in America. So I think as, as a nation, we need to, conflicts happen and that's okay, right? But how do we get past it and reconcile? And I think that's a huge barrier for us. Okay, so follow a question in the middle of that. Um, so conflict isn't necessarily a bad thing, necessarily a bad thing. No, I think conflict leads to progress, right? So we all just, so if you don't come, I think what happens is there's two opposing sides, right? So I see this, you see this. And so for me to grow and learn, I need to hear that opposing side. I need to hear the opposing thoughts because there may be something within that that I can learn from. Mm -hmm. Or I may not learn from it or agree, but at least now I've heard it and I can make an informed decision. If there's no conflict in that, I don't have an informed decision. I just have my decision right, that it may not be informed. So I think conflict is, is very important to grow for a nation, for a person, for a relationship, for anything. Uh, thank you. So some other barriers that you all see. <laughs> uh, yeah, I, I completely agree on that one. I think, um, you know, the, the polarization that we're sort of seeing and our inability to listen to change our minds, like it's almost in the world that we live in, in our society, to change your mind is held against you, right? And um, we've sort of started to value um, maintaining sort of our right and wrong polar opposites in the world. I think we need to actually change our value on that, that we need to start thinking that uh, collaboration, that expanded understanding, all the things that we go to college to do, right, to grow and change and be different and think differently, uh, that we actually need, need that to be more present in the world around us. We need to practice doing that in, in the world around us. Thank you. Oh, we'll share. Um, one of the things that, that comes to mind for me is that we are, uh, I think it's a true barrier that we are so hyper individualistic that <clears throat> Americans, um, we are, in, individualism is like a core value for us. And I think <clears throat> when your whole um, guiding ethic uh, suggests that my life's purpose is to gain, to succeed for myself, <clears throat> and that if I'm successful, then it's better for everybody if I get mine, right? If I can come out on top. And in many ways, it's the, um, it's, just, it's the exact opposite of what's taught in much of the New Testament, where if you've had my, um, my New Testament classes, I talk a lot about this term, other regard, where so much of the, the guiding ethic in the New Testament is regard for others, the concern for their building up. Um, concern for the building up of larger communities and their strengthening. It's an outward focused ethic. And um, I think that when we, we turn inward so much in hyper individualistic kind of ways, we, we get what you've just described is this sort of, I'm, you know, I'm going to bear down in my viewpoint and defending what I think is right becomes more important than living together in a life giving community. You know, I, I, I am kind of, um, I do agree with what's being said, but when I think of a barrier, I think of what Herb talked about is conflict, knowing how to engage in conflict. And there's a, a quote that comes to mind from uh, Stephen Covey in his Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. And this quote, I've, it's etched on my heart right now. Um, I don't know if I do it as well as I'd like to, but he says, uh, seek first to understand before being understood. And I think um, one of the barriers that I see is that there's like this hardness of heart towards listening. And maybe we're giving ear to the wrong thing and we really don't sit back to say, wait a minute, 
am I really hearing what this person is saying? You know, um, my wife and I, we sat through a session of marriage counseling uh, early in our marriage. And uh, this was a, a very tedious process because um, I, I was misunderstanding my wife. And so the counselor told me, he says, look, he says, this is how you can understand her better. Just ask her, <laughs> say it this way, say, okay, love, when you said this, this is what I heard you say. Is that what you meant? <laughs> and uh, it, takes a long, it, ta it takes longer, the conversation takes longer, but when I have that kind of approach, I can really hear her heart and not mess it up, you know? And I think if we can have that kind of posture in our culture today, one of listening um, and under seeking really to understand before we are understood, that we could, we could grow and move forward in resolving some of that conflict. So um, being at a Christian college, um, how does the life and teachings of Jesus really speak to what's going on in our time? Um, for me, I would say, so the way I, the way I approach the Bible, you know, in general is, is I look for practical ways to apply things that I read to my life, right? So I know the spiritual component is very important, but I also grew up in an environment where uh, practicality was needed immediately. You know what I mean? You need to be able to apply what you learned to life. And so things that I actually saw was that he did a good job of that, of looking at people and their differences and valuing them, right? And so he act, he tailored how he spoke to people and what he did with people to that, right? Um, so I just give an example. So he went out and we are we all probably know the story of you know follow me and I make you uh, fishers of men, right? So if he would have went out and talked to them and said, hey, I make you recruiters or salespeople, that wouldn't have related to fishermen. They <laughs> were like, well, I ain't got nothing to do with that, right? Yeah. But he went out and said, hey, I'll make you fishers of men. He adapted to who he was speaking to, right? And so he did a great job of understanding where people were and meeting them there, right? So when I think about that in terms of community, he was humble in that way. It was a cultural humility in that, to be able to talk to people and address people and not compromise his values. Because I think a lot of times we believe that if I am connecting or understand somebody who has a different belief, whether it be religion or race or gender or whatever, then I have to compromise my values. You really don't need to do that to understand somebody, right? You don't need to do that to understand somebody. So he did a great job of not compromising what he believed, but still being able to understand and meet people where they were. And eventually people follow him because of that, right? And so I think that's just a, a great example of how he was, he was able to do that. Yeah, I mean, I think the, the life of Jesus, if you look at um, what we're told about Jesus in the New Testament, the whole life of Jesus is this um, movement toward people, um, always outward facing, always moving. In, he, I mean, he moved into our world, right? Um, took on the culture and the religion of the people and lived among, lived among us, lived among them, and spoke their language. Um, and, and related to them in a way that they could be invited to understand what God is like for them personally and to be invited into ways of life that are God's ways, right? But he didn't do it as an outsider who sort of had this teacher complex of I'm going to tell you all the things to do, but he said, here, come walk with me, come live with me, come follow me. And you know, all the way out to the cross, which uh, Hebrews tells us he was crucified outside the camp, right? This sort of ultimate end of, um, end of self, m continually moving outward. And he says, that's the life. This crucified life is the life, always being willing to move outward and to give up and to say, um, you know, it's, it's not about me getting mine, right? But it's about us living and loving in the way of Jesus. I, I think that uh, true community that represents and that somehow looks like the kingdom of God on earth can't be that. It can't represent the kingdom of God on earth if people are being shut out and if certain people are being um, marginalized for whatever reasons. And um, I, I, I think of, of Jesus' Nazareth sermon in Luke 4 
He says the spirit of the Lord is upon him, and he's there to proclaim good news to the poor, release to captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free. And in Jesus' time, um, the word, I'm, I'm going to go Greek here, but the, the New Testament, sorry. The, uh, the word that often gets translated as healing in Luke's gospel is actually the same word for salvation or to save. And if, if I, to, to heal somebody in his context involves more than just repairing a bodily problem. You know, if, I, if I'm sick, <clears throat> or if I have a, my back injury, my back hurts, Pastor G prays for me, and my back is healed, um, that's a good thing. Um, and I don't want to diminish that, but it's, it, it's different in our context than it was in, in Jesus's, where in that context, um, a disability or a poverty shut people out of community. It locked people, it, it inhibited their ability to participate in worship. It um, reduced them to beggars. It kept them from having a whole life. And so I think part of what Jesus is teaching suggests to me about community is that his whole mission was to bring people who were shut out of community into community and to restore the wholeness of their lives, to restore not just a back or a foot or an arm, but to restore the entirety of their lives, to restore them to, commit, uh, to community and to worship, and that if we're going to embody the message of Jesus, we got to be about that. No, I just want to add on to that point. Just a quick, a quick thought when you said that was not only so he did a great job of that, but also I think he did a great job of showing people who may have been judgmental within community that they were not perfect either, right? That they had work to do. And so I just wanted to point that out as you were saying that, that he did a good job of saying, you know what? We also have, you know, the plank in our eye outside of somebody else. There's some things that we need to work on as well. And I think that's a huge point. Um, yeah. We talked about. Well, to, to, to echo that is it reminds me that when I, I remember when I was in seminary, we always talk about Jesus' arguments with the Pharisees and how they differed. But one of my professors said, don't forget, though, that he never stopped eating with Pharisees. He was always at the table having fellowship with people he had the, the most vicious agreements with and never gave up fellowship with them. All right, I'm going to ask them one more question. But if you have questions, get them ready because I'm getting ready to come your direction. You all can share that mic as I walk down after I ask this question. So, real talk. Beloved community or just can we all get along? Do you really believe beloved community is possible? And have you experienced that before? Take it away, guys. <laughs> who, who going first on that? Who's that one? You got it. Um, I'm yeah. I'm going to go with him. <laughs> um, I, I think it's possible. I think I have experienced it in, in many different ways. I think it's going to be, um, it's a long process, right? I think it's a very long process to get a beloved community, a community that loves the person who is, who you don't agree with or don't like. Because we all, as a matter of fact, let me go ahead and do this. Do me a favor out there, everybody. Raise your hand if you have somebody right now who you can think about that you do not like. Just raise your hand if you got somebody. Think about them. Okay, got you. Now, if I said go out here and tell them you love them after this, would you do it? Raise your hand if you would do it. You got four or five people, right? Okay. So, hey, I'm just saying. It's, right. They, they talking about it right now, okay? No, but in all honesty, I think that uh, that is the difficult part, is being able to see past the, how you feel past the person and being able to, to love them. I think once we get to that point as a community, then we'll be able to get to the idea of loved community. <laughs> yeah, I mean, the question is, is it possible? Yes, I think it's possible. Um, I think it is a, it is an everyday practice, right? So I think we get into this mindset where we say, oh, the beloved community is this almost unattainable thing. And so we stop saying that every day, in every relationship, in every situation I find myself, I have the opportunity to become the beloved community right here today, in this really tiny pocket, you know? And I think that, that is the hope for the beloved community, is that I can do it today. It's just like, you know, the story of the neighbor is, 
who became a neighbor to this man, right? There were two people that saw him and walked by. They were in proximity. There was one person who stopped and said, I will be the neighbor. Yeah. And that's our opportunity. That's good, good. Every time I look around, the empirical evidence says no, <laughs> that it's not possible. But uh, every time we pray, let your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, I think we're praying for that reality, for the manifestation of God's beloved community on earth. And so with God, I think all things are possible. Oh, good, good, good responses. All right, anybody got any questions out there? Anybody? Yes, all right, I'm coming your way. I hope y'all, I don't get no, no feedback. Yes, what is your question? So as we're looking at Rochester as our wider community, um, where do you guys think that Jesus would be if he was here today? Like where do we need to be if we want to be like Jesus? Uh, you keep that one. <laughs> Ooh, look at that, we are out of time. <laughs> That's no. right. That's a great question. Right, right here on this stage with us. No, um, sheesh. Um, I, I would, without name, I'm still new to Rochester, so I get, a, I get to be vague on this. I would, <laughs> I would say everywhere you find people who have been shut out, everywhere you find people who have been systemically marginalized, everywhere you find people who are impoverished, um, and in churches and in worship centers um, and in classrooms, especially my classroom. No, but, but, <laughs> but it's not an either or kind of thing that he would be with the people of God and he would be in the margins. Um, man, I would say if I had to be honest, I would say Jesus would be uh, in chapel Monday, Wednesday, Friday. <laughs> Um, with all of us on the regular. But no, in all seriousness, I would say, I think, I think we forget in reality, Jesus was a radical, right? I mean, Jesus really was. I think we have this like very soft view of Jesus, but when you really look at it, he was very radical. He was doing things that people didn't even think of back then, right? You're healing, you're healing people on the Sabbath, what? Right? And he did it anyway. Eating with the tax collectors, what? He did it anyway, right? So I think he would be whatever we can think of as radical for the greater good though, I think that's where that's where we would find Jesus at. Yeah. Yeah. Um, agreed. I think uh, Jesus is. I I think we we find him in a lot of places, and it's it, for me. It's always important to be surprised by where I find Jesus. That he shows up in the most interesting places and is. Um, in the lives of the most interesting people. So I think, you know, my church participates in an organization called RAIN, the Rochester Area Interfaith Hospitality Network, and churches and synagogues and um, community centers all together, it's an interfaith network, participate in um, helping out people who are experiencing homelessness. And we open up our churches and our doors and create spaces for people that are trying to get back on their feet. They had a, a cr housing crisis. And I, every time I do it, I think Jesus is here. Like no matter what building that is taking place in, it could be um, in a, a Muslim community center and Jesus is definitely there and Jesus is with these people. Yeah, I know for me, it would be where I live and that's in Pittsford. Um, and nice, nice community, uh, but when we moved there, my kids experienced some intense conflict. Uh, and it was, we had to pull them out of school early. We were actually thinking of transferring. You know, my kids went through some intense turmoil. And we were thinking about moving, getting them out, just like, we don't, I'm tired of this, we don't need to deal with this. But after we settled back down, it was just like your call to lean into this. And so I think sometimes the place that where we need to be is the place that we're trying to get away from. <laughs> um, and so I think it's leaning into the tension. Um, and I'll take one more question. Is there one more? Uh, let me, she put it up before you, bro. I love you though. <laughs> wait, wait. Uh, Um, talking about beloved community, 
if you had to be honest, do you think that Roberts Wilson College kind of embodies that? Or if they don't, what's a practical way that we can have that? <laughs> That's the perfect question to end on. Does Roberts Wesleyan model a beloved community? Uh, and if not, what can we do yeah. to become that? So, I mean, I think it's a really important question. And it's actually, I think, a question that needs to sort of um, be talked about over lunches and in classrooms, right? Because it's a conversation for the community to have. Like, it's one thing for me to say, oh yeah, from my perspective, we're absolutely the beloved community. And there are 50 people in this room that say, I don't live that every day. And so I need to know those 50 people and I need to hear from them why they aren't experiencing the beloved community. Because that's where we have the opportunity to extend it. And will that your answer be the answer? Okay. <laughs> so here, here's the thing that, you want to walk away with before you take up your bags. And I understand that not everybody desires to live this way, right? Because you can't force beloved community. You really can't. But it's something that you got to want. And so for those of you who really want that, the challenge is, is maybe to talk with some people around the lunch table. Have lunch with some people maybe you don't know, never sat with, and talk about these things. But this is just the beginning of that conversation. Father, we thank you for our time together. We thank you for the invitation to follow Jesus in this way of living. We thank you for the example of Dr. King who fought for this and uh, fought for equity and fought for change in his time. I pray that we would be individuals uh, who would use all of the gifts, talents, and resources that you've given us to build beloved community. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, you all take care.